Well, for the past two weeks, most of the world's leaders were meeting in Glasgow, Scotland, as part of the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference, also known as COP26. Now, UK Prime Minister, in welcoming world leaders to the United Kingdom, described the conference as the world's moment of truth and a now or never proposition to tackle climate change and work together to keep global temperatures 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Now, climate scientists have said crossing the one and a half degree threshold risks unleashing far more severe climate change effects on people, wildlife and ecosystems. Welcome back to In Focus with David Coletto. I'm David Coletto. On this episode of In Focus, I'm joined by Marin Smith, the founder and executive director at Clean Energy Canada, a climate and clean energy program within the Morris J. Wask Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. It works to accelerate Canada's clean energy transition by sharing the story of the global shift to renewable energy, clean technology, and sustainable industries. It conducts original research, convenes influential dialogues, informs public policy, leadership, and drives public engagement. Marin and I spoke as climate negotiations wrapped up over the weekend in Glasgow at COP26. We discussed the scale of the challenge the world faces to confront climate change, the opportunities for Canada and the clean energy sector, and the role of public opinion and politics in building consensus and driving action on the energy transition. I hope you find my interview with Marin useful and informative. Well, Marin, uh, great to see you. Um, hope you're doing well. Thanks for joining the podcast today. Yeah, we're really happy to be here with you, David. So before we get into COP26, which will take up the, the vast majority of our conversation today, I'd like to start uh, by better understanding the mission of Clean Energy Canada, the organization you've led now more for more than seven years. Can you give us a sense of the kind of work you do um, what your objectives are and, and sort of even the plans for the next few years from your perspective. Yeah, sure. So uh, I founded Clean Energy Canada. It's, uh, I believe it's over a decade now. And our goal is to accelerate the transition in Canada to a clean energy economy. And, you know, what that means is transitioning off of fossil fuels uh, onto clean renewable sources of energy uh, it also means, so that's transitioning the supply of energy, but also how we use energy. So shifting our cars, our buses, our trucks to be uh, using clean energy, that could be electricity, which seems to be the dominant uh, winning technology right now, but also uh, hydrogen is another form. We've got uh, Ballard with hydrogen fuel cells mm -hmm. um, accelerating in that space. So switching our transportation, uh, the heating of our homes and buildings, heating and cooling, uh, and shifting our industrial demand to cleaner forms of energy. So ultimately our goal is to uh, combat climate change and uh, do what Canada needs to do to transition to be reducing our carbon emissions, but also uh, that is going to develop a strong economy and a sustainable economy for Canada with jobs that are going to endure in mm -hmm. the 2030s and the 2040s and the 2050s. So our focus for uh, the next few years, you know, we focus on clean transportation, cars, buses and trucks and how to put in place the policies to accelerate the uptake of clean energies uh, and whatever additional things need to be done to support that whether it's uh, incentive programs or things like electric vehicle charging um, being put in condominiums or uh, street charging, things like that, overcoming the obstacles to the uptake of clean energies. So we focus on clean transportation, uh, energy, clean energy, shifting to clean energy and uh, accelerating the shift to a clean economy. And so in that bucket of work, we're focusing right now on things like steel, uh, cement, the, the heavy industries in Canada that actually do contribute a lot of emissions. We talk a lot about the oil and gas sector, 
but these other heavy industries are an area that has more jobs in the oil and gas sector and an area that's got a lot of carbon pollution that we need to reduce and an area where Canada could actually excel um, and produce low carbon goods and services, mm. uh, things like low carbon steel, for example, and therefore have better access in a global market where people are shifting to buy you know, low carbon goods uh, as they strive to achieve their net zero goals. That's interesting. So there's like a growing market for goods that are produced with, with less emissions. And, and I think, as you said, there's an opportunity for Canada to become a leader there. And not just, I think, in, in the development of the technology to produce um, those goods, but in actually the production of those goods themselves. Is that what you're basically saying? That's really, That's really right. interesting. You know, right now, there's uh, about 135 countries that have committed to be net zero by 2050. You know, you know, what, what exactly that means is, you know, people discuss the differences in that commitment, but we take it to mean it's a signal that those countries are looking to reduce their emissions, including the emissions of the things that they buy, the metals, the minerals, the steel, the things that they import. And we're seeing that in countries like, you know, the EU, for example, talking mm-hmm. about putting a carbon border adjustment in place. So that means everything that comes in, uh, they will look at the carbon content of it and you know, ensure that it has something like a carbon pricing system in the country it's coming from, some sort of way of accounting for the carbon in it. And that's where Canada does have um, it, the potential to have a real competitive advantage because we have such a clean electricity grid right now It's 83% zero emission right now. There's a commitment by the government to make it 100% zero emission by 2035. And we have enormous potential for a lot of renewable energy in this country. Uh, And we can start plugging that into the goods and services that we make here, uh, looking at this uh, growing global demand for low carbon goods. So we have lots of potential. I think Canada's real challenge is um, acting moving more quickly, taking advantage of this and putting in place, you know, the incenting the types of businesses that will be growing in 2030 and 2040 and stopping giving uh, subsidies to uh, businesses that are going to be declining in 2030 and 2040. Uh, Things like the fossil fuel sector that are contributing to uh, our emissions, but also that if we look at global demands, those are not industries uh, that are are slated to be growing, uh, you know, for the next generation of jobs and, and revenue generation. So speaking of commitments, I just want to uh, transition now to, to what uh, I think most of the world has been watching, or not, maybe not all of the world, but a lot of the world has been watching and, and, car- and climate change and, and global action has been um, in the news more probably than it, than it typically is because of COP26, the United Nations uh, climate change conference in Glasgow um, that, that wrapped up this past weekend. We're, we're recording this on, on Tuesday morning. Um, and so Marin, you know, looking at that conference in its, I guess, totality as someone who, you know, you're an activist, you're, an, you're a policy thought leader, um, you're an influencer. How did the conference make you feel? I guess now that we are a few days out from it uh, overall in terms of what it might've achieved and not achieved um, in terms of your expectations going in? Yeah. Well, you know, COP26, just to put it in perspective, it's a meeting, it's a gathering, you know, it's almost like a climate circus. There's so much going on there. Uh, so it's positive that we see people getting together and really wrestling with these issues and making new commitments. But, you know, it's never, one meeting's never going to solve everything. So I would say, you know, as a one-liner, COP26 was really a step in the right direction, but the elephant is still there. You know, the um, Glasgow Climate Pact, which was signed um, by the nearly 200 countries there, it does represent a step forward to fight climate change, you know, a global effort to fight it. There's progress on various fronts, 
uh, company, countries coming together um, to put together finance, uh, etc. But specifically, the language on phasing out coal and phasing out fossil fuel subsidies was watered down at the last minute, and that was disappointing to see mm. that. You know, this is the elephant in the room, and we're all talking about it now. It's very clear that this is the biggest challenge. Uh, these energy sources continue to put out uh, enormous amount of emissions globally, and we have not uh, put in place technologies, you know, that have been discussed for decades now about uh, reducing those emissions from those technologies. Uh, so disappointing that we aren't tackling that one more head on. And also, I, I found it really disappointing to see that the rich nations fell short of their commitment to provide uh, $100 billion in climate financing to the developing countries. You know, the rich nations are the ones that have created this problem, and we need to pay for it and not point fingers at uh, countries that are struggling, uh, you know, with getting energy to mm -hmm citizens in the first place, let alone having to transition that, that that's, that's on us. I was, um, you know, and just, I, I watched or I didn't watch the proceedings, but I bet I um, observed them and read news coming out of it, you know, casually over the last few weeks. And from my vantage point, and, and I was trying to think like, how's the average Canadian, you know, feeling about this and thinking about it. It did feel like this kind of mix of, this is our last best hope to save the planet rhetoric that, that sort of was leading into it. And you heard that from like people like Boris Johnson and other world leaders. And then the almost false hope that was created by all these new, you know, headline making pledges. But then, as you just said, they end it with this kind of elephant in the room, not really being dealt with. And so I, I kind of feel disappointed I guess in a, in a different way in that it, it really, I think versus me personally deflated me, I think a little bit, it kind of, you know, made it seem that this is going to be really hard to achieve. And, and I think that as someone who studies sort of public attitudes around this, there's no doubt that people's concern about, about climate change has, has intensified over time. You know, the, the, their understanding of, of it as an issue has improved, but it does also feel that the longer this goes on and, and the, and the, and the sense that people don't believe that, the world leaders are actually urgently moving that it's going to create, it's going to be harder to, to change individual people's behavior. I think anyways, that's just my, my reaction to it because um, I think there was a lot of hope that this would be a different kind of outcome. And, and it again felt um, although, you know, thankfully the U S is back at the table and, and sort of, you know, China didn't go, but then did and, and participated a little bit. Um, I think it, it felt a little bit, um, um, anticlimactic, I guess, in a way, but to your point, a step forward, but not, not a huge leap, I guess, is the, another way to frame it. Yeah. Um, and, and meanwhile, you know, I'm sitting here in British Columbia this morning after the, you know, second atmospheric river has just gone through and created devastating landslides and flooding uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of people have been evacuated from their homes. The military had to come in to rescue people. Uh, you know, that all the highways are shut down. Uh, Southern British Columbia is cut off from the rest of the country because every highway has mm. been washed out. Uh, you know, this is, you know, November. This is after we've had, you know, a heat dome with temperatures that caused 600 British Columbians to perish in June. Then we had the town of Lytton literally burned to the ground because of climate change after three of the hottest uh, days on record. We've had wildfires here, you know, again, a terrible wildfire season that caused people to be evacuated, houses, uh, homes burned, etc. And so there is no denying that climate change is hitting Canada and you know this is just British Columbia where I'm sitting and I know mm -hmm. that we've had the same issues of flooding of you know heat uh, and wildfires uh, in all other parts of the country as well so it does feel like if there was ever a time to act it is now 
And that is actually one of the things that I think is important. COP is about people getting together and making pledges, but it actually to address climate change, it's not about what we say, it's about what we do. And that is where, you know, Canada reiterated some of the promises that they made during the election, things like uh, banning the sale of fossil fuel powered cars and light duty trucks by 2035, um, ensuring that all electricity will be emission free by that same year. Uh, and so that's good. Um, but like we've talked about, the elephant in the room is really that Canada's climate leadership ambitions are at odds with our position as the world's fourth largest crude oil producer. Um, the oil and gas sector is Canada's biggest source of carbon pollution. Uh, international studies have made it clear we cannot limit the worst effects of climate change while growing our oil and gas sector. Um, so it was good to see Prime Minister Trudeau clarify that Canada's oil and gas emissions will be capped at today's mm -hmm. levels and start declining tomorrow, was what he said. Um, now is the time we need to put that into action. And we really need to um, move forward on this without four years of consultations and discussions. And you know what um, happens in Canada is it takes us so long to move forward on policy. We need to see these policies hitting the ground in 2022 for a number of reasons. One is because we need the emissions to start coming down. Canada is one of the G7 countries where our emissions have not come down. Mm. Uh, you know, we've seen actual success of emissions coming down in, in the other major economies, but Canada's emissions have, you know, stayed the same, uh, gone up. So that, that's what I think is, is the real conversation now is how are we gonna move forward on these um, commitments that have been made and move forward them in a timely way that's going to be effective. And the public is demanding that. Do you think, so, you know, in, in focusing on Canada now, um, to your point about the commitments the prime minister made uh, while he was in Glasgow, and then you had uh, Mr. Guibo, the new environment minister, you know, making a, a, an announcement about uh, conservation and, and investing in the international climate finance commitment um, that, that Canada was making. On the, on the question of action then, do you think, are you hopeful um, and optimistic that, that this new government, and it's not new, I, I know it's, it's we're re-elected, but the, the, this government now that's in place um, is actually going to move faster um, than perhaps it has done in the past and what previous governments did. And, and I guess I, the reason I ask that is, you know, people often say that public opinion is, is a hurdle here. Um, and, and that, you know, governments don't want to move too fast because there's implications on economic, um, you know, uh, indicators, jobs, people getting displaced and disruptive effects of, of the kinds of changes we need to make. On the other hand, um, and I don't know if, if, if you know Seth Klein well, I, I, you may know him. He wrote a great book, I think, on like um, our need to kind of move rapidly like we did during wartime to kind of deal with this issue. And he argued, and I agreed with him, that, that oftentimes public opinion is actually ahead of our leaders, that, that if they just led and move forward, the public would is already there. In your conversations with, with political leaders and, and policymakers in Ottawa and provincial capitals, what do you see as like the biggest barrier then that's holding back, you know, action? And is it public opinion or is it not having the right policy tools in place? Or is it, you know, other interests that are just putting roadblocks up? And I can think of a few, but, um, you know, I'm really curious from your angle, what, what you see as the biggest barriers. Yeah. So, you know, you and I have done polling here in Canada together. Uh, we know that there is strong public support for action on climate change. Um, and so the public is there. And I actually see we only see that support strengthening. Uh, this government, I think, you know, uh, you mentioned, you know, how optimistic am I? 
I feel like we have a cabinet that is well attuned to climate. We have a Minister of Environment and Climate Change who has been in the trenches on this file. So that gives me optimism. He understands this file and he understands the need for urgent action, swift action. Um, we have a Minister of Energy uh, and that role is very critical uh, with Minister Jonathan Wilkinson who came from uh, environment and climate change. And so he also deeply understands uh, the energy transition that's required in this uh, country. Um, I would say the obstacle, the biggest obstacle we have is um, helping Canadians understand what is going to happen to our economy and the communities and the workers who are going to be affected by this. And you know, that is, needs to be a top priority for this government is to move forward the policies to take action. And you know, so we talked about the oil and gas um, commitment that they made to put a cap on emissions. This is a top priority because this sector they, it is the, one of the areas in Canada where the emissions are growing. Um, but following through with that, they need to pair it with a very clear um, worker transition strategy that looks at workers. And in fact, we've done work on this. Uh, there's a lot of skill sets in the fossil fuel sector that are readily transitioned to other mm -hmm. areas in the energy sector, in the growing, you know, what we call the clean energy sector. So if you're, you know, a welder or a driller or an electrician, you know, or a construction worker, uh, those skill sets are needed to build, uh, you know, green hydrogen plants, geothermal energy, uh, to be working on building retrofits. There is, you know, they need electricians, construction workers, uh, welders, you know, drillers. Um, and there's a group of drillers in Alberta that uh, have formed a geothermal alliance and are looking at how they use their skills and equipment on geothermal, for example. Uh, there is a hydrogen plant going up in Edmonton, $1.3 billion construction mm. project. Uh, so we're already seeing this transition happen. But what we haven't done is actually made a clear plan so that people understand where do they fit in this future? Because everybody wants to know how they fit into the future. They don't want to be you know, considered pushed out of the economy. Um, there is a transition going on. So how does that transition work for communities and for families and workers? So that, that I would say is one of the challenges. Um, in terms of priorities for the government, the oil and gas cap is a top priority. Number two, I would say, is electrifying everything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we talk about this advantage that Canada has with 83% zero emission electricity. Um, the potential for renewables. And for example, Alberta has the same solar potential as Florida. Most Canadians don't know that. Um, we have some of the best wind and solar resources on the continent. Um, mm -hmm. And we're gonna need to double the size of our electricity grid as we transition to clean electricity. Um, so for the government, there's a top priority to get the policy tools in place to get us to that 100% zero emission uh, grid and expanded grid. Um, there's also uh, real opportunities for jobs uh, across the country on this. And then we need to plug everything into this clean electricity grid. So uh, a priority for the government is things like a zero emission vehicle mandate for cars, you know, cars, trucks and buses, transportation. Uh, that is the second biggest part of our uh, emissions. So oil and gas are a quarter of our emissions. Transportation is about a quarter of our emissions. And both of those sources of emissions have been growing. That's why these are the top priority for the government to focus on, to get the tools in place, the policy in place, like a zero emission vehicle mandate and the supports, things like, uh, you know, uh, incentives and EV charging, uh, which are going to help Canadians transition to these new forms of uh, transportation. So just so I understand, um, and, and for our listeners to clarify, when you say a zero emissions standard, that is basically saying by a certain year, all vehicles sold in Canada, new vehicles sold in Canada must 
not produce any emissions, basically. They must be zero emission. And, and yeah. sort of setting that standard and, and enforcing it going forward is what you're looking for. That's right. And so what it does is it requires the car dealerships to sell a certain percentage of cars. Because what we're finding is there is plenty of demand for um, citizens who want to buy zero emission vehicles, but there's no supply. They go to the lot and, you know, studies have showed 40, 50, 60 plus percent, depending on where you are in the country, you, you won't even have a zero emission vehicle to try, mm -hmm. let alone to purchase. You'll have to put your name on a waiting list to purchase something. You'll be expected to buy it sight unseen. Well, we're talking about shifting to a whole new technology. It's very, you know, people are yeah. have anxiety about doing that. They want to try the car out. So this uh, zero emission vehicle mandate or a zero emission vehicle standard requires the dealerships to sell a certain percentage of cars. So that means they get them on their lots because they have mm -hmm. to sell them. Um, BC and Quebec both have a zero emission vehicle mandate. And what we're finding is the majority of all the cars sold in Canada, the zero emission vehicle cars are being sold in those provinces because the car dealerships have them. In BC, uh, the last quarter, 13% of new car sales were zero emission. And in Quebec, it was 10%. Mm. Last year, during the COVID uh, pandemic, 10% of new car sales in British Columbia were zero emission vehicles. So it really shows that the policy works. You just put that policy in place uh, so that the cars are at the dealerships and people are going to buy them. It, and it, just to put those uh, numbers in perspective, overall for Canada, uh, zero emission vehicle sales are about three and a half percent. So it's hmm. telling you that in places like Ontario or Alberta or Nova Scotia, where you don't have that mandate, people aren't buying the cars. And when you go to the lots, you'll, you'll see why. It's because you can't get one. There. Can't try it out. And you raise a good point. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was actually in, in, in Vancouver and I was renting a car because I needed to drive to Whistler. And I had the option of renting a, a zero emission vehicle. I didn't do it. Um, and I thought of myself, why didn't I do it? Well, I was like, I don't know how to, to, you know, I've never driven one and I don't know where to, where I would stop if I needed to, to, to re I was going to use the term, fill it up, but recharge it. Right. Even my language is so one paradigm and I, we've got it. So we actually have to, you, you raise one important point that if I don't even have the option to test drive this vehicle and feel it, um, am I going to really make that transition? If I don't, if, if we, as as policy, if public policymakers don't put in place as much as possible to make it easy to do, consumers are going to just stay with what they know. We know that is consumer behavior in every part of our lives. That's, that's how we have to do it. So it's such a, it's, it's, I've never thought of it that way, that if there's no car on the lot, I'm not going to buy it because who's going to buy? It's like saying, you know, a lot of people, I guess, in some markets purchase homes on, sight unseen, but they don't really want to. It's because they're kind of feel like they're forced to. Um, if you have the choice between buying a gas powered vehicle and a electric vehicle, but you could drive one and not the other, it makes that choice so much easier. So, so it's almost basic consumer behavior, right? Um, but that policy helps overcome it really, really importantly. Well, when you come out here again, David, you can borrow mine. I've got a Nissan Leaf that I've had for six years. I think it's a 2014. So it's an old model. Oh my gosh, they are so fun to drive. They have such fast pickup, uh, they're quiet, they're smooth. And so that's why I know that these zero emission vehicle mandates work because once people try electric, they're hooked. And we'll go back. believe me, I haven't met anybody who enjoys going to the gas station. You know, I don't think anyone does, I agree. It's not a... <laughs> <laughs> and talk about, you know, getting oil changes out of your life. An electric vehicle has about the same number of moving parts as a sewing machine. And they don't break down. Like they, your mechanical bills go way down. But also the inconvenience of your car breaking down at an uh, inopportune time. Uh, that's really not part of your life anymore. And so absolutely, you have to think about where you're charging and how far you're going and that that becomes part of your life but it's pretty easy to adapt to that and you know we we plug ours in at home most people actually charge their car 
90 plus percent of the time at home. At home. And, yeah. you know, most of us aren't driving around in a day enough that, uh, you know, that you need to charge your car while you're out and about. Obviously, if you're on a trip, you do, and you got to make a plan for it. But, you know, when we're on trips, we all stop, you know, we stop to get snacks, to stretch our legs, to use the washroom, and you realize, oh, this is not an inconvenience. Um, and of course, the beauty of an electric vehicle is there's a big guilt-free factor because you're not yeah. burning fossil fuels and that makes you feel good. Yeah, all good reasons to buy one. Um, so Marin, thank you so much for, for, for all your, your thoughts and, and your perspective. I guess I want to end the conversation then is where, where we are today. Um, COP is over and, and I appreciate your perspective that it's really just a meeting. I like your description of it as more of maybe a circus where there's just so much happening and it's, it's more about conversations and, and setting a, a target than really action. Um, you talked about what you'd like to see in terms of the hard emissions cap on, on the oil and gas sector, on um, the, 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 the zero emissions mandate and some of the other things that the federal government can do to kind of incentivize big changes in both transportation and, and large industrial emitters. Um, I guess coming out of COP and, and seeing kind of how the world's reacted to it, um, you know, how, how optimistic are you, I guess, that, that we're on a, on, on a, are we at the, maybe I'll, I'll reframe this, are we at a turning point or um, moment where I think a lot of change is going to happen really quickly? Like, do you, do you feel we're on that cusp? Yeah, that's such a good question, David. You know, I put myself in the group of people that are stubbornly optimistic uh, you know, I feel like we have to. We're talking about the the future of the planet here. Um, but my optimism comes from, uh, you know, one, the climate crisis is here now. We are feeling it and living it. Uh, Canadians are feeling it and living it. In addition to looking at pictures of, you know, places around the world that are under the same challenges of flooding and fires uh, and droughts. So there's a real urgency there. But secondly, you know, the technologies that we were talking about a decade ago are really ready for prime time now. The costs have come down so significantly for things like not just solar and wind, you know, solar has dropped 90% over the last decade. Mm -hmm. Um, but storage, which was what was needed to go with it, batteries, some form of storage so that those intermittent uh, renewable energies could be stored so that we could get uh, a, a strong um, base of electricity all the time. Um, and, and other technologies, you know, we're looking at green hydrogen coming online. We're looking at things like heat pumps, uh, which, you know, a decade ago were expensive and noisy. Uh, so in many, many areas, the technologies are here and ready for prime time. And thirdly, I would say what keeps me optimistic is that in many countries in the world, um, Canada is not quite here yet, but people have linked their economic strategy with their climate strategy. So it's no longer climate action is about pain, where we're going to do with less, you know, and then it's in conflict with an economic strategy people are recognizing we can move to cleaner technologies, cleaner energy, and create jobs and a strong economy that's gonna work for communities and be sustainable over the next decades. Um, and that, that's where we need to put our focus and our energy. Let's be investing, you know, are the money we're investing in Canada, let's be investing in any businesses and industries that are going to be growing in 2030 and 2040, not in industries that are going to be declining. And there's a real calling out now of stop subsidizing the fossil fuel sector, shift those subsidies. If we're going to use subsidies, let's shift them to those things that are going to be growing in the future for jobs. So those are some of the things that keep me optimistic, I would say Canada has a lot of work to do. 
Uh, we need to see the kinds of policies we've talked about here, the cap on oil and gas emissions, stopping the subsidies to the fossil fuel sector, uh, moving forward on an electrification package. Um, very quickly, in particular, moving forward on that transportation, mm -hmm. uh, which is such a huge part of our emissions. And then finally, investing in industries and businesses that are going to be growing in 2040, 2030, uh, and ensuring that we use this to strengthen our economy, make it healthier, more equitable, include, uh, you know, Indigenous inclusion in this as we move forward and transform it. Uh, and ultimately, it's going to result in better air quality and better health outcomes as well. So creating all those linkages, helping workers and communities transition uh, as we move forward, addressing things like affordability, these are all part of the package of what we need to do as we go through this transition. Uh, but I think that you know, a government that can connect all of those dots together and move forward swiftly uh, on this plan is going to see progress mm -hmm. uh, on emission reductions, uh, but also in building, you know, maintaining that public support for climate action. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's all about, it's all about action. We're all the pieces the are there. Process. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you mentioned technology, the policy tools, public opinion, I think elite, if that's a word I want to use, opinion is there. there there's, you know, there's this confluence of, of these factors coming together. And I think that the last thing that we need is just the political will to just drive it and, and not look back, right? And not worry about um, the so-called political risk of this stuff, because I think the, the real political risk is not acting in the long run. Um, so I love your optimism. Um, makes me feel much better. It's, it's, it's almost noon here in Ontario. I know it's early, uh, it's morning still in, in British Columbia. Marin, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it's always fun working with you uh, on the research we do together. And um, I look forward to, to seeing your team's uh, continued push to to make this transition happen. So thanks so much. Yeah, well, thank you. And I guess I just want to finish off by saying I am stubbornly optimistic, but it really is about action. The time for talk without action is over. You know, we're on a course right now for 2.4 degrees of warming. Uh, we need actions from what we've agreed to, and we need to do more. We need to strengthen uh, our commitment. So COP26 was really just a stepping stone uh, to stronger commitments. But what I'm going to be looking for is swift action here at home in Canada. We'll watch for that. Marin, thank you so much. Have a good day. Thanks, you too.